Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I was excited for this opportunity. I'm glad Jacob is able to go and preach a gospel meeting because it gives me more opportunities to speak in front of you all and present a lesson that I have worked at. I do apologize. This morning's lesson I, uh, I used a, few, like a month ago on a Friday afternoon. So for those of you who are there, I've tweaked it. I've made it hopefully a little bit better, but hopefully it doesn't dull you. And I also hope that everyone here this morning came with, with their thinking caps because this first lesson is kind of quizzical, kind of thought-provoking. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In verse 28, in, in this part of Romans, we're, we're at a part where Paul is talking about faith. Faith and works and the differences. In verse 28 of chapter 3, we read, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so my question to you all this morning is simply, can faith alone save us? My answer is yes. And I hope that you'll stick with me through this lesson so I can point out why. Simply put, our faith is our foundation and the driving force behind all of our actions. And it, this, this means that our faith is not, not, is not inactive. It, it is inseparable from our works. They go hand in hand. They're the same thing in my mind. They cooperate with each other. Our faith produces works. Let me make sure this is... There we go. We all have faith in different areas of our lives. It, in different things that we do, we have different uh, things that we put our faith in. And with our jobs, we put our faith in that, that if we do a good job, we will be rewarded with our wages. Uh, with our kids, we put our, our faith in that if we raise them right, they will, they will submit to the rules that we establish for them. With our friends, if, if we socialize correctly and we put ourselves out there, when, then our friendship and our circles will grow. We have faith in that. We put our, our faith in that. And if we truly believe that Jesus Christ came to save our souls, and that God will give us His grace and, and show grace upon us in saving us, then our actions will reflect that as well, because we have faith in God's grace. And our faith is an act of faith. Before we get really into this lesson, I want to point out something. Point out something that, that may come up as a, as a question. In Romans 3, we have the pastor saying our faith, uh, our faith is separate from our works. However, in James, we have a passage that states that faith without works is dead. In James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, we'll read that, and we'll see that passage. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. These two passages seemingly pit each other against themselves. The one in Romans where it says we cannot be justified without our faith, or our faith is justifiable without works. And yet James says that we have to have works with our faith. But, these, but the Bible does not contradict itself. It was not written in contradiction with each other. What we see is that these two different authors are talking about two different problems that arise. Two different people, peoples, two different churches that have different problems. And so what we see is that both of them are saying that faith in God's grace saves. In Romans 3-5, through 5, Paul is comparing two different aspects of our lives. Are we saved by grace or are we saved by our works? And his answer that we've seen is we're saved by grace. Because if we start to think that we are saved by our works, then our confidence is in ourself. Our faith is in ourself rather than in God. And if we do that, then we, then we understand that we can save ourselves. If we believe that we can save ourselves, well, then there's no need for God's grace. There's no need for God if we can save ourselves. However, that we, however, we have faith in God, because we understand that God's grace is what truly saves us. God's grace is what gives us that opportunity to be in heaven one day. God has forgiven us, and rather than being saved by our earthly deeds, He saves us. In chapter 4 of Romans, in verse 4, he makes the point that when one works, the wages that are given because of his works are not considered a gift. 
They're considered a, a debt that is owed. And think about that. When we go in and work our job and we get paid for it, it's, it's kind of expected that we're out there working our, our nine to five and we, we get our paycheck because we did our work. We did what was expected of us and we got our reward. However, when, when God saves us with His grace, it is not because we have done enough for that grace, but rather it's because we need His grace. We can't do enough for that grace. It is a gift. And this explains in, in chapter 3, verse 27 of Romans, when Paul argues uh, about our boasting and how we, it should be excluded. If we are given a gift, if we are, are blessed with a gift, then we don't tend to boast that we have got this gift, that we've created this gift, we've done it for this gift. Rather, when we're, we're given something, we, we thank profusely the person who has given it to us. We thank them, and, and we show our appreciation for that. Paul, Paul tells us that if we put our faith in our works, it sets up an opportunity for us to boast in ourselves, rather than boasting in God, rather than boasting in God through His power, through His grace. However, if we look at this, Paul argues that if we focuses on, focus on God's grace, then we are able to have our faith reflect that. Our faith will show that, and our actions will show that because of our faith. Over in James chapter 2, we'll flip back over there real, real quick. When we read that faith without works is dead, it's, it's very simply, simply put for me to understand that our faith cannot be active without producing works. We can't have faith or say we have faith and then not produce action and not produce the works that we, that we are so often told about in the New Testament. They're connected. They go together. They work together. It's like this. If we believe in something today, if, if I believe that, that the Dallas Cowboys are going to win their game, then I will, my actions will reflect that. I'll be, I'll be happily telling everyone that they're going to win, that they're going to do great. And then after they win, I'll be there to be like, yeah, see, I told you. I, did, I told you about it. However, if we have faith, and if we have faith in God, if we have faith in His ability for us, then we'll want to do the same thing. We'll want to tell everyone that God's saving us. God has the ability to save you, to save me. And we'll try and show that as often as we can. Which points directly to we cannot simply do nothing if we truly have the faith that the Bible says we need to have. Because faith causes our works. It's the manifestation of our lives. It's our founding block, our, our foundation. If we, if we do what we are called to do, if we have that faith, then our actions will reflect that. It will shine through us in everything that we do. Which means that Christ will shine through us in everything that we do. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10. In this passage, we're, we're reading about a centurion. A centurion who, who sought Jesus to heal his servant because his servant was paralyzed. Chapter 8, verse 10 is where we'll be reading. Actually, we'll, we'll go back up to verse 8. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority, which soldiers under me, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. You see, the centurion, who was a man of his own power, a man who was in charge of many, understood that if Jesus just said the word, it would be done. Because if the centurion could command people by telling them one thing and they would do it, then certainly Jesus could heal someone by just saying it. And this is the faith that I think we should be having. That faith that, that all we need to do is, is show Jesus that we understand His power. That we have faith in His ability over ours. Not only that, the centurion's faith brought him to Jesus. He, he was actively seeking Jesus to help him. We need to be actively seeking Jesus to help us. We need to be actively seeking through the Word to understand more about Him. In a way that will, will show our faith, that will help us to grow our faith. God will, will keep His promises for us. 
We see that time and time again in the Old Testament to the New Testament. That God makes a promise and it's done. It is, it is kept. God does the same thing for us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. In the passage so often called the Hall of Faith, we see something very similar between every single character that is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, we'll be skimming through some of the verses. In verse 4 it reads, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. In verses 8-11 through 11, we read, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same per- promise. Verses 17, verses 20 through 24, all of these different verses show us something very simple. These characters acted because of what they believed. These characters did something because of what God had promised them. Abraham moved to a place that he had no idea about. He knew no one there. He knew nothing of the area. And he moved there because God promised him something. Because he had faith in God's promise. These characters had the faith that if that God what God wanted and expected of them, they would they would do it because God was a a God who fulfilled their his promises. And me we we are expected to have the same level of faith as well. That God will fulfill his promises no matter what's going on in our lives. We could be dealing with any number of things. Like Abraham, we could be moving and not know where the people around us where we're moving, not know the area around us when we're moving. We could be starting a new job and not know exactly what we're getting into. But we understand that as long as we put our faith in God, that He'll be there with us, that He'll help us through whatever comes our way, then our actions will reflect that. Our trust will be in Him rather than trusting in ourselves to get through those things. Like I said before, our faith not only causes works, but our faith is active. This means that it's constant. It's always working. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll read some of what I think is applicable to us if we have this faith. First Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Pursue faith, pursue righteousness. We see that as a verb. To pursue something means to go after it, to con- Continue after it. When you, when you think of pursue, I often think of, of something like a, a car chase. You have a police officer pursuing the culprit, pursuing the person speeding out of his way. And it's active. They're, they're constantly following them. That's what we're supposed to do with our faith. We're supposed to pursue it, to, to find a way to strengthen it, to make it better. If we think of this, if, if we have a weak faith, we will not react or do what we are called to do. If we have a weak faith in someone who comes up and, and questions us because of what we believe, because what we do because of our beliefs, then our faith may start to crumble. They may start poking holes at where we say we have faith. And we may start realizing that our faith is rather weak. You see, that's why we need a strong faith, a strong foundation. Because if we have that strong foundation, when someone comes and tries to poke holes, we'll be able to tell them why we believe what we believe. We'll be able to tell them and show them why we believe what we believe. Without a strong faith, how can we truly show Christ is in us? How can we truly show that we believe in Christ? It's an interesting idea, but we must be able to show that every day. Turn with me to Philemon 4. Philemon 4, and it's verse 4, not chapter. I made the mistake last time of saying chapter 4, and that's not true. Philemon's verse 4 through 7, and we'll focus on mainly verse 6, but I want to read this whole passage. I 
I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saint have been refreshed through you. In verse 6, we see this phrase, that your faith may become effective. We can have an active faith. We can be pursuing faith. But if we keep that faith to ourselves, if we hide that faith, then it's not effective. It's not an effective faith like we're, we're told here. Our faith should be there to help build up those around us, not only ourselves. Our faith should encourage others to understand the love of God and to help them see more about the Bible, help, your, help each other see more about the Bible. If we, if we notice someone who, who seemingly has great faith, I know I am often wowed by it because I am encouraged to try and be like that, to, to try and have that same amount of faith that that person has. And it drives me to work more on my own faith. And if others see that we truly believe, that we truly live a life of faith, then they'll wonder about it. And maybe instead of those coming to poke at your faith, maybe they'll come and ask you some questions to figure out more about their own lives, to figure out more about their own faith. It's an interesting idea. But it's one that if, if your faith is effective, it'll help to spread the gospel. It'll help to encourage those who are struggling. I've used Chandler oftentimes in my sermons because his, his ordeal is something that is so relatable when I look, read through the scriptures. It's so relatable to look at and say, I've seen that firsthand. When Chandler was diagnosed with cancer, when he went through it, he had, he had this enormous amount of faith. Some, it was something that I had never really seen before or noticed before. But whenever something bad would come at his way, he would never really grumble. He would never really be sad or show that emotion, at least not at first. But rather he would be comfort. He would, he would show a sign of comfort or confidence that everything would be okay, no matter what the outcome was. And Chandler's faith in his time was encouraging to my family, to my mom who was, who was scared of what would happen next, to my dad who was unsure. And yet they could look at Chandler and see his faith, see his confidence in God, and understand that everything would be okay. Everything would turn out just right. Think of it also this way. If, if you're running a race, if you're doing a competition of some sort, and you're starting to struggle in that competition, whether it be running, whether it be a sport, football, baseball, and someone starts to cheer you on, someone starts to motivate you, to, you hear them calling out and praising you for your your, your ability and telling you to do better. It's going to help you. Oftentimes, yesterday when I went on a run with, with Bailey, I was, I was struggling. And yet at the end of my run, there's, there's Bailey cheering me on to finish it strong, even though it was really hot and I was really tired. But yet that, that kind of encouragement can't be understated. That's what our faith can do for others. It can encourage those to continue to press on, to continue to push on while they're struggling. Turn with me to 1 Peter, and we'll see another aspect of what our faith should do. First Peter chapter 1, and verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes through the te through that perish perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ our faith should praise it should show glory in god for all that he has done for us because he has done more than we can ever repay he has done more than we can ever work for our faith is not a, a faith that we, we count up, and at the end of the day, if we have so many points, we get a reward. Our faith is one that, no matter what we do, it is still God's grace that saves us. It is still God's grace that helps us get to heaven like we are trying to. And if we're using our faith to praise God in everything, this means 
even in our trials, even in our sufferings. What you see in that passage, our sufferings are meant to grow our faith, to strengthen our faith. But we're able to praise God through those trials, through those struggles, because we understand that He is there with us. He's there to help us, to get us through it. When we read about the testing of our faith, oftentimes we, we, we think oh, we're going to be tested with the toughest struggles we can. We're going to be tested with those, those things that we only ever hear about. At least I do. I always look far off that, oh, that, that's going to be something difficult. I better, better really prepare. But sometimes it's the small things. Sometimes you, you may be reading an article or, or overhearing a conversation from your friends, and they bring up a point that may, may instill some questions in you about why you believe that. Well, why do we do something a certain way? Why do we meet on Sunday mornings? Why do we sing without music? And it's something that may instill a question in you that you have to figure out, that you find out for yourself. Because when you find something out for your own knowledge, it, it cements something in your foundation. It cements something in you that you understand, well, well I've understood this. I've seeked this out, and I've I now understand it a little better. Our testing of our faith will help us to grow. It'll help us to become better Christians. Because as we're tested, as we're put through these trials and questions and struggles, then our faith will, will again reflect that confidence in God, that trust in God's grace. Because God has given us everything. God is there for us whenever we call on Him and when we don't. And because of that, why can't we be thankful? Why can't we show appreciation to God? Why can't we glorify God like we see that our faith is supposed to be able to do? If you look through any number of the Psalms, you see prayers of glory, prayers of, of thanks to God because of what He has done for David or Solomon or the other authors. It's, it's interesting to think, well, these, these authors are doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing with our faith. Why can't we do it? Why can't we show this kind of praise to God like they are? We should be praising God continually for what He's done. Because our faith shows that. Because if we have faith, we understand that it's through Him and not through us that we are saved. Simply put, our faith saves. And it's, it's not a faith without anything. It is not a faith that, oh, I, I have faith, so I'm saved. It is a faith that because you have faith, your actions will, re will, will reflect that. Your lifestyle will reflect what you put your faith in. And if we put our, put our faith in God, then our, our lifestyle will show us having an active faith. It will show us being thankful for God's grace. We will reflect that confidence in Him. And if we have an active faith, then we'll be constantly doing God's will. We'll be constantly doing what He wants of us rather than what we want for ourselves. Actions speak louder than words, and especially in the case of faith. And so we should strive to run that race of faith, showing God's grace in all that we do. I didn't know if I would have time for this, but I think I do. I've got a little bit left. So if anyone has any comments or questions, if you, if you want to ask them, feel free to.